Hello, everybody, and um, welcome to the first forum lecture of 2022. Happy New Year, Happy New Year of the Tiger. My name is Hannah Brancato, and I am the forum curriculum coordinator. Um, so it's great to be here with you today. Um, I'm going to just share a brief introduction to Dr. Rael Sally and then turn it over to our featured speaker for today. So um, opening today's lecture is Mabel O. Wilson, um, the inaugural event for spring 2022. And Professor Wilson will be introduced by the founding director of the Space for Creative Black Imagination, Dr. Rael Sally. This event is produced in partnership between the space and Micah's first year experience Forum 1 and Forum 2. Um, and the Make Unmaking Racism minor program. Micah's first year experience FYE, Forum 1 and Forum 2, is a year-long course sequence that includes a themed guest lecture series curated for the whole freshman cohort. In 2022, the curriculum and speakers are designed to emphasize diversity, equity, inclusion, and globalization, DEIG, and dedicated to our beloved FYE faculty, Fletcher Mackey, who passed away last summer. This spring semester forum two includes the forum lecture series by global speakers today, Mabel O. Wilson, March 7th, Shay Pather, uh, April 4th, Joyce Scott, while addressing the themes of experimentation, transformation, and integration for the first year students here at MICA. February 14th is reserved for MICA Talks, a TED uh, Talks style presentation in collaboration with Student Affairs and their student led committee. Um, a special thank you to the Events Office, Strategic Communications, Student Affairs, Forum Advisory Committee, the SPACE, and the FYE Office um, for all of their support in making these events possible. And finally, um, follow FYE at FYE Micah on Instagram and our YouTube channel where this will be uploaded after the event. So without further ado, I will turn it over to Dr. Rael Sally. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for the introduction, Hannah. Welcome, everyone. I'm very, very pleased to be with you. Um, before I say anything else, please join me in this preliminary land acknowledgement. Micah is working with various versions to arrive at a final institutional statement. We acknowledge that we live and work on the traditional ancestral and unceded lands of the Piscataway and the Susquehannock tribes, that indigenous people have lived here since the 10th millennium BC and have been joined through the Northern migration by the Lumbi and the Cherokee in this region we now call Baltimore, Maryland. We also acknowledge the people enslaved and exploited who did and do work on this land, enabling us to live and Mother Earth from which all life springs. Here at MICA, we strive to honor the ancestors and to work equitably and honorably toward social justice with their descendants. So welcome everyone. A few special thank yous before my introduction to Dr. Wilson. Uh, Thank you to the First Year Experience Program. I also want to thank the Office of Justice, Equity, and Transformation, JET Office at the Massachusetts College of Art and Design, MassArt, one of our partners for this event. The goals of the JET Office are to, quote, guide and lead work that achieves system systemic equity in all areas of the educational institution through transformation of campus culture, end quote. In partnership with the Space for Creative Black Imagination, which responds to the challenges of the 21st century by its dedication to the study of culture, race, social justice, and imagination beyond established paradigms through interdisciplinary, interactive, and social projects in visual design and media studies. It is my distinct honor to introduce Mabel O. Wilson cultural historian, architectural designer, and curator, an amazing creative overall, Mabel O. Wilson teaches architecture and black studies at Columbia University, where she also serves as a director for the Institute for Research in African American Studies. With her practice, Studio And, 
She was a member of the design team that recently completed the memorial to enslaved laborers at the University of Virginia. Wilson is, authored of, is author of Begin with the Past, Building the National Museum of African American History and Culture from 2016, Negro Building, Black Americans in the World of Fairs and Museums from 2012. She's a co-editor of a volume called Race and Modern Architecture from the Enlightenment to Today. And she is a founding member of Who Builds Your Architecture, YBA, which is an advocacy project to educate the architectural profession about the problems of globalization and labor. For the Museum of Modern Art in New York City, she was co-curator of the exhibition Reconstructions, Architecture and Blackness in America from 2021. I don't know if you can see this book, but that is the catalog from that exhibition. I'm, I'm pleased to have one. Exhibitions of her work, Mabel Wilson's work, have been featured at the Venice Biennale, the Art Institute of Chicago, the Insta Istanbul Design Biennial, the Wexner Center for the Arts, the Cooper Hewitt National Design Museum's Triennial, the Storefront for Art and Architecture, and SF Camera Works. Her work is in several collections of major museums globally, and I am proud to say that we have her with us in this conversation at MICA. So please join me in welcoming Mabel O. Wilson. Thank you, Rayel, for that very generous um, introduction. Let me make sure I can share screen properly. While you do, I'll let folks know that if there are questions, um, please use the chat function, the Q&A function. Uh, we'll be moderate, monitoring both the chat and the Q&A, but if you have a question you'd like to address to the professor, um, please log it there and we will attempt to address it um, at the end of the talk. Thank you. Great, thank you for that. Um, and hopefully you can all see my screen and um, that is working fine. So I want to begin by, you know, um, say that I am speaking on the traditional land and the unceded territory of the Lenape, and I pay respect to their diaspora and honor the past, um, current, and future presence of the Lenape on their homeland. Uh, let's see if I can move this around. Perfect. And so I also just want to thank Raul uh, for the invitation from the Space for Creative Black Imagination to engage the first year experience at MICA. And I also want to convey my thanks to Mina and Hannah, John and Ash for all their work to organize um, this virtual talk. So since we don't have a lot of time, I am going to, to get started. And hopefully, you know, I really looking forward to a QA and a and um, we'll share today a bit of how I work in my practice. So I began Studio And, um, and I chose the ampersand. I, I, I began it in 2007. Uh, and I chose the ampersand as a sign that my practice was both collaborative, as in and other people, as well as transdisciplinary, uh, as in and other disciplines. And so my practice has navigated between the written works, you know, as Rael mentioned, architectural projects like the memorial and you know, other kinds of work that I've been doing, installations, um, performances, uh, and curatorial projects. As this early diagram of my practice illustrates, critical research finds expression in one form. So for example, on the left, these are, you know, kind of 2D scholarly works. You see the book Negro Building listed there, um, or, uh, um, uh, you know, on themes of urbanization, things like the away station as written projects. And then they find um, parallel projects in another creative modality. And so on the right is a kind of three dimensional space where you, you see geography and time, you know, and so Negro building leads to um, uh, competition for the African American Museum. And then oddly enough, that ricochets back to a book on the museum. And so it's a way that I've I've engaged um, the practice of Studio N, you know, over the last couple of, of decades through my work. And so my talk will explore why I developed these methodologies in order to situate blackness and also understand race in the built environment. 
So I wanted to talk also about my own education. And so in my architectural education, I have an undergraduate degree at UVA and I have a graduate MArc degree from the Graduate School of Architectural Planning and Preservation at Columbia where I currently teach. And I realized that in order to draw black blackness into architectural discourse and to make visible anti-black racism in the built realm, that I really needed to transgress the boundaries of the discipline. And to do this, I turned elsewhere. I turned to art, I turned to critical race theory, to black studies, to poetry, and to literature. And early on, it was the work of Toni Morrison who provided critical methods and deep theoretical frameworks for doing this work in my practice. And so this is a quote from her essay, Black Matters, where I substitute architecture for what she's doing in the English language. My effort to manipulate architecture was not to take standard architecture and use vernacular to decorate or paint over it, but to, as she writes, carve away its accretions of deceit, blindness, ignorance, and paralysis, and sheer malevolence so that certain kinds of perceptions were not only available, but inevitable. And that's a paraphrasing or kind of rewriting of Morrison. So her nonfiction works like Playing in the Dark, Whiteness in the Literary Imagination, through that work, I began to understand it was important to reckon with the ways that the Western body of knowledge, what's called its episteme and its ontology, um, that creates a framework of whiteness has made it provisional, if not impossible, for the African, along with the African blackened in the hold of the slave ship to become Negro, it made it impossible to attain what the West calls a historical consciousness. This is the subject formation that the West imagines as being modern, with blackness consigned to the past, to the primitive, to the savage, to the not modern but wholly necessary, as Morrison writes in playing in the dark whiteness in the literary imagination, to give definition and depth to whiteness. Now that relegation on being on the threshold of modernity awaiting development is, as many have written, a misreading of what it means to be modern. Now like Morrison, the poet Norbesi Phillips also recognizes the same trap in the Western body of knowledge, in its discourses, right? Its writings and its practices. Norbesi Phillips distrusts the language of documents and policy. She herself is trained as a lawyer, right? And wrote an incredible poetry book called Zong, exclamation point. Now in Zong, she's wary of the language of being and history that can't account for something that was called the Zong massacre when in 1781, hundreds of enslaved people were tossed overboard a slave ship heading from Western Africa coast to Jamaica, and they were tossed overboard to conserve resources. Now, once they returned to London, the slave traders attempted to collect through insurance payment for the lost cargo. Those humans turned into property on account ledgers and in court proceedings. And it's the court proceeding that we have as the only document of this event. And it was an important event in the emergence of abolition, particularly in the, in, in, in the UK. So Philip writes in Zong of this violence, quote, language in that which these events took place promulgated the non-being of African peoples. And I distrust its order, which hides disorder, its logic hiding illogic, and its rationality, which is simultaneously irrational." End quote. So I ask, what is architecture if not order, logic, and rationality? But can architecture also be hiding disorder, illogic, and irrationality that is a double bind of modernity? As we see in this early Republic painting where you see liberty and slavery juxtaposed. Here is Liberty Cleo with her hat, of what's called a Frisian hat as a sign you know, of, of antiquity that she had been enslaved. And here she is freeing enslaved people. This is a painting from 1792 that hung in the library company of Philadelphia, which was an early public library. And that library was the library that was used to write the Declaration of Independence, to begin working on the Constitution. And you see that world of order that liberty makes, right? The, by the grid and the books and symbols of painting, right? Artistry and music and geography. 
mechanics and astronomy. And then on the right, you see freed Africans who, who are grateful to liberty to be free and they are in nature, right? They're not in that ordered world. They're in nature around their own liberty uh, pole and those ships in the back are waiting to take them away um, back to Africa, which was you know, being envisioned by both Europe and America for the formation of Sierra Leone and then eventually Liberia, right? So the discourse of architecture, it's representational tools, how it's history, you know, how it's entangled with state power and racial capitalism, its aesthetics and technology are knotted with that double bind of modernity, of racial thinking, its representation and its practices. So in response to that double bind over the past 30 years, I've engaged in a black study, one that allows me to make visible my own history and bring black cultural practices and sensibility to the making of the built world. This is an ethos of dialogue and collaboration that frames my practice as I've explored many recurring themes such as home places and remembering. And so this is a, um, an image of Carrie Mae Weems. I just finished a very long essay about her work, but she's also someone who's inspired um, thinking about archives, thinking about history, thinking about the built world and power. So I wanted to start with home places. So in my last studio in, in when I was finishing my uh, master's of architecture, which is called Studio Six, which is taught, taught by a scholar, uh, 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 architect Stan Allen, we were asked in the studio to unpack the single um, uh, family American suburban house through techniques of collage. Now I chose to unpack the latent blackness and invisible forces of anti-black racism embedded in the single family suburban house. And in fact, I grew up in a little white house seen here uh, in coastal New Jersey in the 1960s. And in fact, my father designed that particular house. Now my entree into the world of languages and ideas was through a book called Before We Read. And here are two images for, before in that book whose pictures shown here not only reinforce gender roles, right? Because you could see Jane as she mimics mother in the kitchen, right? And there um, uh, um, is, is, is Dick mimicking dad doing nothing while the women are in the kitchen. But we can also see how whiteness is normalized in these images, right? Of being in, in domesticity, in American domesticity and in the house. But it's normalized not by words, but by images. This common edition of the Dick and Jane Primer series reinforced that before we read words, we decode the world through images. And clearly, neither word or images are neutral. So again, I turned in that Studio Six project to Morrison, and I unpacked the epigraph of her novel, The Bluest Eye, which yet again has been in the news, right, uh, today. And here, Morrison is carving away at that type of iconic Dick and Jane primer. And note how the first paragraph on the left introduces the single family house of the suburb. Here is the house, its generic colors, its entry and family resides there. And notice how it teaches us reading through forms of identification, through types of sociality, what is aesthetically pleasing, various types of effective responses that then makes learning to read possible, right? Now the second paragraph in the middle, the rules of grammar, its structures have been removed. We can read words, but without the pauses of capitalization and punctuation. And as a consequence, meaning here becomes elusive, right? So here is the house, it is green and white it has, right? So it just goes on, right? Now the third paragraph, Morrison carves away even more by removing the space between the words. She compresses it. This string of letter makes the detection of words difficult, if not impossible, thus making reading difficult and enunciation impossible. It invokes the madness and silence latent in the text. And if you read The Bluest Eye, Morrison tells the story of a little black girl, Picola, who lives amidst untold violence and suffering in her everyday life. Now, Picola believes that if she had blue eyed eyes like her doll, she would be beautiful and hence happy and safe. And in that 
that that discord right between her reality and what she's learning to decode that reality insanity in the story becomes her refuge right so this became an operational method on the found object the primer and it became a method for me to uncover the hidden powers of the representations of logic and meaning how whiteness and patriarchal patriarchy orders meanings in space uh, in language and i wondered if the same operation could be applied to architectural representation to architectural drawing right so i chose the levittown house as my site of operation a long history of white settler colonialism, which forward whiteness as property, as Cheryl Harris writes in her iconic critical race theory text, restrictive covenants and bank lending practices ensured that the United States post-war federally financed suburbs stayed white and heteronormative. Why did you select Levittown to live? We were looking for a place to buy a home. We looked at Levittown, and we liked the homes here. We liked the advantages that Levittown seemed to offer in uh, comparison to other cities. And we understood that it was going to be all white, and we were very happy to buy a home here. Right. Now, looking at drawings, the plans and sections of a typical Levittown house, I adopted Morrison's strategy of carving away to misread the spatial logic of the house through its own representations. And, and I also turned to black artists who have a long history of working with found objects and like the assemblage artist Betty Saar, whose liberation of Aunt Jemima became a figurative and generative figure um, in the project. The drawings I made dissected rooms to find below the stairs and between the walls and inside cabinets, around plumbing, under the floors, in the basement and inside the attic, representations of blackness by the way of a mask, by this figure of Aunt Jemima that I borrow both from um, uh, Sar, but also from advertising, and a charm, and then Kisi, a Congo charm, right? And they, you know, embed themselves in the house and this process became a way of rereading that space of the house, as you can see in these drawings. I also reread the city and the suburb, and I looked at the suburban houses of the South Bronx's Charlotte Gardens. And in that rereading and misreading, I discovered what the project was, which was a house for a Grigri, a talisman for domestic rituals and a container for the everyday practices of black life. Now, for this early exploration of blackness, I also drew on the familiar work of a Los Angeles-based artist, John Adderbridge, who passed away about a year ago. These are two of his, two of his projects. And you could see how he works, you know, with, with found objects as well. Now, John Adderbridge is actually my mother's brother and my uncle, and he grew up in the Jim Crow South. Another white house, though a double shotgun house in Greenville, North Carolina, my mother and uncle grew up actually in a house nearby, but this is the home place I remembered associated, right, with North Carolina. Now, my mother and my father migrated to New Jersey in the mid-1950s, and shortly thereafter, my Uncle John migrated to Chicago and then Los Angeles, as did many of their generation fleeing the oppressive racism of Southern segregation at the turn of the Civil Rights Movement. This is another one of my uncle's projects, and as they moved, they carried with them a rich culture of making things, of making a way out of nowhere. And I've written home places, travel like people and packages. Any place you collect objects of remembrance, model ships and family photograph, or practice rituals of everyday life, cook fried fish from old recipes or make life soap, all of these things serve as spiritual entrees back to one's home place. So my Uncle John eventually settled in Los Angeles in the 60s and joined a cadre of artists that included Betty Saar. He was also very close and collaborative with David Hammonds and Noah Purifoy and others who made revolutionary artistic statements from the detritus of the Watts Rebellion of 1965. And so here, you know, are images of that rebellion and, you know, a work, you know, that spoke to the kind of black nationalism of that period, work from 1969. He built full installations that found beauty in urban blight. This is an installation on the right, um, a public installation that he did in, in, in Pasadena from his series, The Aesthetics of Urban Blight, right? Because blight is supposed to be ugly and torn apart and removed, renewed. 
Now with architect photographer Peter Tolkien, we spent a day with my uncle John about how he not only made art out of everyday life, but also architecture. Now he was a painter as well, a photographer, and a mean blues flutist or flautist. He found art in many things, including the culinary, and we shared the sweetness of grilled catfish while the soulful strains of John Coltrane drifted through his studio in South Central LA. And so this is why this essay is called Catfish and Coltrane, a conversation about making a home site. Um, a is for artist, door is for vintage VWs that my uncle restored inside behind that the garage door. And the colors of blue, red, yellow mark hazardous materials for making art inside. Doors with holes and artwork on white walls, windows framed by the aesthetics of urban blight and fragments of rag on one side of the wall, right? And you can see that on that piece right um that is on the wall but on the other side is a towel bar that carried rags for washing dishes uh and as you could see screws as buttons on in search of the missing mule from 1993 and screws mark a similar asymmetric rhythm connecting two countertops in the kitchen this is a life of art experimentation of building and unbuilding and his spaces were deep like the music of Sun Ra, who he knew in Chicago, and just like my Uncle Johnny's immense legacy as an artist. Now, over the long arc of migration, thousands of Black Americans, like my parents and my uncle, moved to and transformed the places where they arrived. As my colleague Farrah Griffin writes in a poignant exploration of migration narratives who set you flowing, after leaving the South, the next pivotal moment in migration, in the migration narrative, is the initial confrontation with the urban landscape, usually experienced as a change in time, space, and technology, as well as a different concept of race relation. This results in a profound change in the ways in which the mechanisms of power work in the city, end quote. And this is very much part of the migration series that Jacob Lawrence does. So back in 1995, prior to Studio Anne, I began a partnership KWA with actually an undergraduate classmate, Paul Carreyou. And one of our early projects was to explore these familial histories of migration. We were interested in how migration as a force does not alter urban space in, media, in immediately apparent ways. Instead, these transformations occur over time and begin within the confines of domestic spaces. And so we wanted to chart how these communities appear and disappear and often fail to be registers as urban traces. So a full scale installation, the away station examines the architectural spaces of urban migration. And so as you can see on the left, we imagine a kitchen, a bedroom, a living room and a bathroom that are typically separated. But for those in migration, these domestic routines may be compressed and compacted into the same space, as you could see on the right. And a kind of improvised domestic practice emerges, right? And this is what happens in the away station. So imagine all of those things compacted into one space. And then you could see on the right how all of those things, like a sink or carpet or a door, um, are packed into the space and then the red lines are kind of sectional cuts slicing like running this density through a bandsaw right and so drawing on the techniques of assemblage art the away station collapses all of this to a dense amalgam of objects and building materials brought in transition furniture and clothing and sentimental objects are packed in with newly acquired objects of consumer culture, right? And so these are just some images of our fabrication process. And these are some of the kind of details of it. So for some, these way stations, a hotel, a residence of a family or family member or friend, perhaps a refugee center is a point of transition before return to their homeland or point of transition along a path of adaptation into this new place or perhaps even assimilation. And things and memories packed together into a dense milieu in which the rituals of everyday life unfold. Now the away station's 15 towers can be unpacked according 
in the space that they inhabit and can adapt like the migrant to the unpredictable circumstances of sight. So just here in the triangular space of the storefront for art and architecture in the Lower East Side of, of New York City. And you could see in the, in the foreground how the drawings are part of what we call the drawing table. Now the towers are illuminated inside. Um, and so the artifacts have this kind of enigmatic and uncanny quality. And as you move through, we recorded narratives that documents the project's journey. And you hear these migration narratives as they replay describing journeys of migrating into the city where the project was inhabited. So in New York, seen here, you hear narratives of of, of two Haitians, one Jerry, who's describing her experience of migrating to Brooklyn, and Jean Uric, who describes his migration narrative from Haiti to the Upper West Side of Manhattan when his family literally fled overnight the wrath of the Duvaliers. You also hear of Alan, an undocumented Filipino woman, and her aspirations. And we also hear my father, who explains why he left the segregated South in search of opportunities for his family up north. This is when it was shown in, in, in uh, San Francisco and the narratives that play there are a Colombian woman who migrated from Peru seeking independence for herself and for her family. And we interviewed a really remarkable um, Chinese American man who left his homeland at age four to arrive in San Francisco in 1915. In Los Angeles, we interviewed my uncle Johnny about his journey westward from North Carolina to LA. It is in these interim homes, these way stations, that people establish domiciles that are situated between the memories of homelands from which they recently fled and moved and the imaginings and desires of the places they aspire to be. Rememory. Now, when it opened in 1826, the universities of Virginia's 10 pavilions, you can see here on this engraving, housed faculty and families. Its lawn rooms, which are the lower levels between those 10 pavilions, bordered 125 white male students, and the verdant swath of the terrace lawn in the middle was crowned by the rotunda, right? This platonic form uh, emulating the panth great pantheon in Rome. This was the centerpiece of the ensemble that housed the library. Now, in his plans for this, what he called an academical village, Thomas Jefferson, the signer of the Declaration of Independence, the second governor of Virginia, the third president of the United States, plantation owner, surveyor, and owner of 600 enslaved people over the course of his life, brought together, as he wrote in a letter, an exclusive community and an, an environment that he designed to be conducive, quote, to health, to study, to manners, morals, and order, end quote. Again, that word order, right? Which is what architecture does. Now, when I was an architecture student at the University of Virginia, that's where I have my undergraduate degree, what was silent in the official historical narratives about the university's antebellum period from 1817 to 65 was mention of the academical village's dependency on 150 enslaved men, women, and children at one time. And we see here in that engraving, which is a cartouche from a famous map from 1826, we see here an enslaved woman who is taking care of a white child of one of the professors at the end of Pavilion 9. That history hid in plain sight for 155 years. So how do we build spaces for remembering, suturing together the past from the archives and sites of slavery, which still bears the traces of the physical epistemic and ontological violence of enslavement. Paraphrasing my colleague and friend Saidiya Hartman in her essay, Venus and Two Acts, can we retrieve in a memorial for UVA's enslaved community what remains dormant, the purchase or claim of their lives on the present without committing further violence in our own act of architectural and spatial narration of the past? In 2016, I joined with architects Mijin Yoon and Eric Howler, um, Charlottesville landscape architect Greg Bleem in the middle, conflict mediator and UVA professor to the right, uh, Frank Dukes, 
to win the commission to design, to design the Memorial to Enslaved Laborers at UVA, which opened in the spring of 2020. Seen here at the plantation Montpelier, which is the house of James Madison, is Brooklyn-based Eta Otitigbe, who joined us a year later. Now, in the beginning, for over six months, we engaged multiple, multiple communities from within the university and in the wider city of Charlottesville. What we heard was that the memorial would need to tell the unvarnished truth about the past to have any legitimacy, and that it needed to bring the community together to learn and reflect on that difficult history. The memorial needed to dis, uh, express dualities and not only pain and suffering that could not be left out, but also resilience and dignity and the humanity of those who were enslaved. And lastly, it needed to be a living memorial, an ongoing memorial to acknowledge that the work of this commemorative landscape remains incomplete. Now, it was important to convey the material presence of Black lives um, at UVA as this uh, response to our survey shared, right? That as a Black American, I feel an internal pride of gazing upon every brick, every pillar, and every garden at the university, and knowing that this fraught path has birthed an undeniably beautiful present. So we must feel beauty, pride, and gratitude, right? So that sense of the materiality of the making of the university was very, very important from what we heard. Now, along with collecting aspirations like these and hearing about designer meetings and experiences and the stories that needed to be told by the memorial, we also did extensive research into Black traditions and spaces of gathering. We looked to cultural forms and rituals that could be translated into a design. We explored, for example, ring shouts, a low country ecstatic dance whose performers move in a circle and whose rhythms and movements connect directly to West African practices. So the circular form of the ring shout, overlaid as a broken shackle and others, became relevant references for us. Now you could see here, this is the memorial, um, and it's cited in dialogue with the rotunda. Both are 80 feet in diameter. Now the rotunda, as you could tell, sits at a high point on the lawn, and Jefferson placed it at a ridge line upon which the university was built. The careful terracing of the lawn in an architectural section allowed Jefferson to create pavilions that were two stories on the lawn side, as we saw in that engraving, but three stories on their backside, on the garden side thus creating a lower level walkout basement, which housed the spaces where the enslaved labor. So behind the pavilions, enclosed by the famous serpentine walls, which are actually higher than you see today, were actually work yards. And this is where the enslaved labor to chop wood and haul water and wash clothes and slaughter animals. Now Jefferson understood slavery to be abhorrent. In fact, he understood it to be morally corrupting and thus he employed architecture and the architectural section to hide and conceal it. He does exactly the same thing at Monticello, hiding the dependencies below ground so that you have this kind of pure vista into the landscape. Now the memorial architecture, as you can see in the lower part, in contrast works to reveal and to open to invite. And we utilize the landscape into the section to create an open like bold figure in contrast to the closed sphere of the rotunda, even though both are in fact 80, 80 feet in diameter. Now the memorial is oriented northward toward the direction of freedom and a path to the left lays out a step, 48 to be exact, for each year enslaved peoples lived at UVA. The memorial is a series of nested rings fabricated in Virginia mist granite that has um, been, had been quarried, quarried um, nearby in Culpeper, Virginia. The center at the top, as you can see, holds a gathering space for learning, for performance. It was important to have that because the activists, the student activists who actually pushed for the memorial wanted a space of gathering. This is inscribed by an inner ring which holds a timeline of historical events. The next layer out is a ring that creates a concave surface of remembrance and that outer convex surface 
creates a canvas for expression. And each of these rings speaks to a different layer of history and meaning and interpretation. Now this is one of the ledgers and you can see December 29th, extra hands at Christmas, $2.50. So to develop the layers of history in the memorial, we work closely with a group of committed historians. Their thoughtful examinations of UVA's history provided rich material. To name names, to tell the story of the enslaved required that we engaged in an archive of work letters, uh, work ledgers and personal letters of slave owners. And as such, it is an archive of daily life, one laced with silences of things not told and also of violence. Now the historians estimate that 4,000 men, women and children built, labored and lived at UVA in that period from 1817 to 65 but we know almost nothing about the detail of their lives. But we do recognize all 4,000 by memory marks, which are layered across the inner arc of the memorial. Now for most, 3,111 persons to be exact, the archives do not record a first name and a last name. As the spreadsheet on the right shows, we did find records for 889 persons. Of those 889 references, we know mostly the first name of 577 community members. And for a handful of people like Isabella Gibbons, Sally Cottrell, Thrimston Hearn, or Henry Martin, we know a first and a last name. Now for the remaining 311 recording pers recorded persons, we use kinship relationships and occupations to remember their lives. And I'll show you what I mean by that. So as you walk into the more memorial, you're enveloped by a genealogical cloud of names and marks and relationships. This is a detail of that wall. Now the list of names and dates, right? This is what we expect from a, a Western memorial. These are their traditional features, but given our archive, we had to imagine and reimagine social relations, but more importantly, rehumanize the experiences of the enslaved. And as a result, Visitors engage Henry, Isabella Gibbons, Jane, Jack, Roberti, and Randall, not as individuals, but as families of sisters, grandmothers, uncles, and friends, as workers who took pride in what they did as woodcutters, janitors, laundresses, and fiddlers. Carved into the granite are also 4,000 memory marks, and they speak back sometimes with tears to their descendants and to us. Now the community of names appears across from a bench with a timeline and a water feature that captures the attentions of visitors who learn a very different history of the university. In contrast to the wall of marks and names which rises and inclines outward, a shallow near level water table shares with visitors the history of enslavement at the university. The 70 historical entries inscribed into the water table begins actually with the arrival of the enslaved Africans to Virginia in 1619. And it ends with the passing in 1890 of Isabella Gibbons. The timeline also covers, for example, the arrival of 10 enslaved laborers with Jefferson to clear the land that would become UVA in 1817. And it covers a history of transactions, work, and violence. And as you can see on the right, this very steady stream of shallow water washes over that entire arc of the timeline. And this references libation rituals, baptisms, as well as the currents of rivers that carried people to freedom. Here are two entries. So you see, for example, 1826-29, Frimston Hearn, quote, a tolerable good stone cutter, quote, the stonework at UVA, including completing the rotunda steps or further down the arc, 1850, three students attack a 12 year old enslaved girl in a field near UVA. The students are expelled. Now Isabella Gibbons, who I mentioned previously, was a teacher and founder of the Freedmen School in Charlottesville. She is the only member of the enslaved community from which the archives have yielded a full name, a date of death, a photograph, and a brief written record of her experiences that was published in the Freedom 
um, uh, the Freedman's record in 1867. She serves as a witness, and this is what she remembers in her, her, her article for the Freedman's record, quote, can we forget the crack of the whip, cowhide, whipping post, the auction block, the handcuffs, the spaniel, the iron collar, the Negro trader tearing the young child from his mother's breast as a whelp from the lioness, have we forgotten that by these horrible cruelties, hundreds of our race have been killed? No, we have not, or ever will." End quote. So her remembrance concludes the historical timeline. So here she is. Here's a photograph of Isabella Gibbons. And so artist Eto Otitigbe became interested in the layering of information we had gleaned from conversations, from visiting historic sites like the plantation Montpelier and also Monticello, Jefferson's plantation nearby, and the archives with rare photographs of people enslaved by UDA. He was also interested in things like the bush hammering, right? The rough tombstones from the Daughter of Zion African American burial ground in, in Charlottesville, and things like the vertical quarry marks, the vertical marks and stones that would have been worked away by skilled masons like Thurston Hearn. So here we're looking at a close-up of that photograph of Isabella Gibbons' eyes. It's curious, just as a backstory, the original image is in the archive of the Boston Public Library. Now, Gibbons had been enslaved by UVA's mathematics professor, William Barton Rogers, and Rogers would go on, he would leave UVA and go to Boston, where he would go on to found MIT. So here are her eyes. And so, Eto made this amazing relief image in granite, and it was a technique that he developed in his own work about being a black man and what it meant. He's Nigerian American of being visible and visible and invisible at the same time. So it's a lenticular technique that he developed in his own work. So we take Gibbons' eyes, and to realize a relief image of her eyes in the granite, the team working with Eto developed a unique process and customized software and worked with our fabricator, Quora Stone, um, who fabricated all of the pieces in uh, uh, Madison, Wisconsin. The data was translated from the photograph into a virtual model. Then a machine tool graph path was generated to create a virtual surface that was overlaid onto a digital model of the memorial's curved surface, right? Because it's parabolic. All of this took place digitally working remote in teams, Quara, but also including UVA's Office of the Architect, which was a very important collaborator with us, and our contractor, Team Henry, who was incredible. Um, and so all of this had to be done before cutting into the stone. So you see here in that image, that process. So it's an overlay of this lenticular image, and it's sort of a merging of the sort of bush hammering uh, texture and then the vertical kind of markings, right? Uh, and then this image, right? So it's like three layers onto one, and this is the result. So visible to the public on the exterior are Isabella Gibbons' eyes. And her eyes appear and disappear depending on the time of day, the light, the clouds, right? And how the body is approaching the memorial. And her eyes are symbolic of all of those who were enslaved and their descendants who continue to witness the social transformation in the fight against anti-Black racism. Now, we were supposed to dedicate the memorial in April of 2020, but of course, that is right at the beginning of the pandemic, and so the dedication was postponed. The fence around the memorial remained intact, and essentially, um, uh, the, the sod was put down in early June. Days after, literally like three days after the construction fence at the memorial was removed, the University of Virginia's medical school's group, White Coats for Black Lives, organized a protest. The group took the knee for eight minutes and 49 seconds in remembrance of the murder of George Floyd, a gruesome reminder of the violence and injustices that persist in the wake of slavery. The memorial also became a, a site where Black Lives Matter protests at that period were also stopping and uh, kind of acknowledging and, and, and paying tribute to um, the ancestors. So I just wanna say by concluding, the memorial of enslaved laborers came at UVA came into fruition 
through a collective desire to face the past. Another community, and we were very excited about this, that it was made visible through this collective reckoning was a group who claimed kinship with the enslaved community. And here we see a reunion of some of these descendants with their ancestors who lived and worked and died on the grounds of the University of Virginia. That connection between descendants and ancestors and those black neighborhoods and communities in Charlottesville and the university is only a beginning not only of remembrance, but also of accountability, to reckon with the truths, including those horrible cruelties, as the Gimmons quote on the timeline described. So I will end it there, and thank you for listening today. Thank you very much for that wonderful presentation. Um, we are, at about five minutes before our closing time. So I'd like to ask anyone in our audience who uh, has a question, please to use our Q&A feature um, and I will attempt to get to your question. And as you do that, as you do that, um, if your question comes in a bit later, that's okay too. Um, we can respond to you by a direct message. I wanna thank you, um, Professor Wilson, for that wonderful and um, really spectacular presentation. I feel like many of the things that you said um, impact and directly exemplify the themes from the first year experience for this year, um, which are transformation Ex uh, experimentation, transformation, and integration, it seemed to me that there were concrete examples of each. Um, and I was surprised at the ways in which your, uh, the most recent project at UVA um, is literally in a certain sense, a space for black imagination. And so I would love to hear just to comment briefly on the impact and maybe value of such a space. Um, yeah, I mean, I think part of what was really important for us, um, well, one, I, I would just say, I think we got the project as a design team um, because we were willing to ask questions. Like we didn't come in, you know, we were one of five teams that interviewed for the project and it's a state school. So it's like a state uh, tender, you know, it's a request for, you do a quest for qualifications, RQ and RP. So this is the RP stage. And there were four landscape firms and then us headed by architects, Meechan and Eric, were the architects of record. Um, and I think they were just very shrewd of putting together a group of people who were willing to not say that we didn't know. We knew it had something to do um, with reckoning with the history of anti-Black racism and white supremacy in America when we said that off the bat. We said we didn't know the answers, we didn't know what to design, but that this was important to open up that dialogue. And it was an unusual project because the client had no site, no program and no budget. And that's either a dream or your worst nightmare. And as we found out a year into the project, yeah, Charlottesville turned into America's worst nightmare, right? You know, that happened smack in the middle of the project. So it was a very, very difficult project in that sense, sometimes very emotionally stressful difficult, um, but it was great to open up a dialogue with many groups of people to build stakeholders. We actually had community ambassadors who were going, we went to churches, um, we had dinners, we, you know, like we, we tried to speak to as many people as possible and also recognizing that people still call the university a plantation. And there were people who were like, why are you spending money on that when we need housing? Or we, you know, like we recognize that and acknowledge that. But we also knew that the process could open up a productive dialogue about a lot of things. And that was clear up front that low wages at the university were a problem. The cost of housing were a problem. Like we didn't shy away from conversations about that even amongst our team. And I think that's what we found really um, productive is to open up those dialogues, right, of what's possible. And the fact that now there is this nonprofit that can hold the university accountable 
in that space and literally tell the unit, now this is what we want to do. This is what we are demanding. Like that is the best outcome, right? You know, if it could be an impetus for the formation of that descendant group, great. How fantastic. I'm mindful of our time. So there are a few other questions in the q and I'm going to, uh, we have time for one of them. I think we have about 45 seconds for a response. The question reads, could you share another example like UVA that contains designs and thoughts about kinship between community? Um, and then I'm gonna read another question in relation to that. With investing so much time and energy into projects you have been a part of or you have done for yourself, how does it make you feel when it's done and you see the success of these projects? So I hear in the first one, what examples or connections to kinship between community and then the second one about uh what happens when it's done yeah i mean I, I think i've learned a lot about collaboration like who builds your architecture is a huge collaboration it's more of a kind of educational advocacy one smack in the middle of the profession around recognizing labor issues um and also, you know, working on reconstructions, the show at MoMA, we did an amazing advisory group um, that helped us think through precisely because MoMA is typically an organization that relies on its archive, but we had a problematic archive. So we opened up dialogue with a lot of people and out of that project has emerged the Black Reconstruction Collective. Again, so, you know, the, the exhibition we were hoping would be a vehicle for something that would be an afterlife. And there's this amazing Coursera course um, on you know, some of the ideas that we had in the show. And so, you know, again, that expands outward. And so I would just say, you know, kind of leverage these institutions, even ones that may seem um, difficult, you know, to, to produce things that can work also outside those institutions in different communities. And that's something that I've really learned. And that's why collaboration is important for me in my practice. What a wonderful moment to close. I want to say thank you, uh, Mabel Wilson, Mabel O. Wilson. Uh, thank you to Micah and the First Year Experience Program. Uh, please note we have two more events in the series for this semester. Jay Pather and uh, Joyce Scott are coming up with the in partnership with the Space for Creative Black Imagination. And it's been wonderful to have this time with you. So thank you very much. And we look forward to the next project. Thank you all for being here. Thanks for coming and thanks for having me. Take care all. Bye-bye.